So thanks everyone for uh, bearing with the uh, difficult situation. I'm in Boston right now and uh, appreciate you being able to meet here remotely while my dad's in the hospital. Um, uh, it's uh, it's something which um, is going to limit us a little bit in terms of Blackboard use and, um, and so on, but uh, I brought my tablet, um, which could allow us to hopefully um, draw things out uh, with some uh, versatility, even if uh, Blackboard use is, is ruled out. But uh, I'm really excited to, to be with you um, to continue our discussion on chapter 12 of Drive Abstraction. And uh, to introduce uh, in today's discussion, to the contents of chapter 12 as offered by uh, Eugenia Cheng, um, to complement that with some discussion of some uh, themes in category theory that she's uh, emphasized throughout the course. Um, so uh, we're going to be discussing today so the categorical perspective on um, defining quantities by the roles they play in a category. We'll see uh, how this plays out some ways in set, where, for example, rather than talking about the elements of a set, we deal in terms of functions into that set. Um, uh, and if a particular type of uh, function um, helps us enumerate elements, a function from what's called a terminal object. Um, we're also going to be seeing how in set, you could think of loosely at least uh, a set up to isomorphism being defined by the functions in and out of it. Um, rather than having to talk about the specific elements in that set, we can deal in terms with the functions, the role it plays in the category. And that old chestnut I've mentioned many times, one knows a person by the company, they keep a kind of similar principle. One knows the, the fingerprint of, of a given set by how it relates to other sets. Um, We'll see this uh, principle as well in epimorphisms and monomorphisms, uh, which which have their relationship to classical set-based ideas with functions such as uh, surjection and, and injection. Okay, so um, uh, we have a lot to to discuss that complements um, uh, the the strict text of Chapter Twelve, um, but I hope put puts it in perspective and helps um, prepare us for some ideas covered in later chapters. Um, so uh, we'll be referring to the text. I'll also be introducing um, some of these uh, illustrations of these concepts that Eugenia Chen highlights in other chapters um, as well, and, and some in, in this chapter. So we're going to uh, switch over to slides, and I'll try to remember to post these slides um, uh, to the Canvas site. A um, little bit about kind of the, the context of perspective here. Um, uh, Eugene Chang has mentioned many times that the central idea in category theory uh, is, is this idea of defining something by the role it plays in, in some context. And that context is captured is most commonly expressed by, represented by, characterized by a category. Um, and uh, in one of the uh, things we try to do in category theory is when we're dealing with sets, we, we, we try to avoid talking about the elements um, and, and sort of properties of morphisms, for example, defined in terms of elements. And instead, we place this focus on the, the network of relations. So Eugenia Cheng in um, chapter 12, and I'll see if I can grab the book here. I um, have the option of citing chapter and verse, as it were. 
Um, you know, she notes that, and I think the opening page or two of chapter 12, um, how sets and functions, this category sets and functions helps inspire many other categories which deal with structured things that are like elaborated sets or embellished sets. Um, they have extra structure. Maybe it's associated with a pre-order and, you know, maybe it's less than one thing is less than another, or one thing divides another or what have you. Um, one thing is a subset of another. And there we're, we're dealing with uh, things that have kind of a flavor of, of, of a set, but embellished in some way, um, uh, has more structure. And then we have these relations between them, which are kind of like souped up or restricted functions, which preserve order. They have this extra, they preserve the structure, the structure of preserving, they honor structure, they respect the structure. Um, and, and so this notion that in set, we try to avoid talking about elements carries over to these other categories um, defined in this way. And, and it's kind of manifested in, in many ways. And you'll see some concrete, some of your first concrete exposure to particular aspects of this. That I think, you know, like many things in category theory, they should make you puzzled, or they often make you puzzled and should make you make you think some, but um, um, you'll you'll find them probably growing on you, and um, and you'll you'll find a sort of notion of defining important objects like initial objects and terminal objects or final objects, another name for them, um, uh, you know, is is fairly intuitive. It's emerging from these network of relationships, and they play really big roles important roles within uh, within the category set, and then often in these elaborated embellished sets, um, we see in other categories and structure preserving mappings between them. Um, so we'll see a little bit these first uh, universal constructions informally. Um, so just to give a concrete example of this, um, when we have set, the category set, we have objects which are individual sets. And we might be excused for thinking about them as consisting of, of elements within them. Um, but again, we try to avoid um, talking specifically about those elements, enumerating, reasoning about, talk about the properties with respect to these elements. Instead, we deal with the relations that this object is in. And one thing you'll find is that, you know, in terms of these elements, um, we can, instead of talking about these elements as some sort of indivisible intrinsic feature of this set, what we can instead take is a relational stance. And we can say, well, look, if we consider the singleton, set, the set with a single element in it, just one element. Um, we could imagine a function that maps, traditional plain old function that maps from that singleton object, which is a which is a type of terminal object. I, this is just the terminal object and set is a singleton object. And in, in, in this, you could imagine functions, these morphisms that map the function functions, which are the morphisms in set, which map from the terminal object into this set here. And if you think about it, how many of these functions, these morphisms are there in set from the, from the terminal object, that is the function with a single set. Think about the definition of a set, um, number for each of its possible inputs, here there's only one. It's gonna it's gonna pick out one and exactly one element of the the codomain, the target. So it's got to pick out exactly one one of these. So I'm gonna ask you how many different functions are there from 
you know, but the singleton, the three. set with one element. Yeah, into each of these. And there's three, exactly. One from this to this, one from this to this, and one from this to this, right? Um, we've got basically we gotta to say it informally, we've got to pick which of these elements this guy goes to, right? We only have one thing to pick, just this one possible input. And we've got to figure out what target does it land on? Just one target we could pick, and exactly one. It's either this one or this one or this one, right? And so these functions we say are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the elements. It's like these functions name the elements. It's like this function here represents element one, and this function represents element two, and this function represents element three. And in short, we, we don't need to talk about the elements as some intrinsic feature. We could just talk about functions from this terminal object. In other words, instead of getting wrapped up in these objects, have these little things inside, which we got to talk about, these intrinsic things. No, no, no. Just, just talk about, if, if we need to reason about the size of the set, reason about how many functions there are from the terminal object into the set. That gives us the count of func uh, the count of elements of that set. There's no need to think about piecing apart, taking apart, tweezering apart this set. No, no, no. We just we just reason about mappings from this terminal object uh, into the set, and we can ask how many of them there are, or deal with a particular one, you know, uh, which represents a, a particular unit in the set or whatever, you know. The, the one that that has some nice property um and you know that count will be different um based on on the size of the set and i had a a nice little uh uh picture that i drew several years ago and i had sought to to uh put it here but i'll i'll, I'll stick it here um so you know, from this terminal object into into uh, a set here, uh, I can't remember if I drew this or David Spivak or Brennan Fong. But in any case, if we have this is the terminal object, the singleton set, the set, a set including just one thing. Um, there's well into the singleton set. There's just one function. It has no choice, right? There's no choice in the matter. This thing has to map to the single thing there. You have to pick one of these. It's got to map to. So just maps to a single one. There's just a single function. There's no choice in the matter. Um, but meanwhile, a map from the singleton object into uh, an object with secretly three elements has three possible maps, right? It can either map to this one or it can map to that one or it can map to that one. Map, it can't map to all of them together. That would violate the notion of a function. For each element of its input, that's just one, it's got to pick a single unique one of the output. So there's three possible functions, one that goes here, one that goes here, one that goes there. And you could think of them as kind of naming these elements. And similarly, mappings into two, there's two possible functions. So the mappings from the singleton set, from the terminal object, um, are in one-to-one -one correspondence. Now, you may be getting confused here that like, wait a minute, I thought the terminal object was the target of functions, you know, but but here it's like the source. Well, uh, okay, but it can it can play a role as a source as well. There's It is, it has one, it is true, the terminal object we'll see will have one unique arrow from every other object. From every other object is a unique arrow to the terminal object. That is true. But we'll see that it can also have functions out of it. There's nothing preventing it. Um, and you'll notice why it has the terminal object here, the singleton, I would claim it's the terminal. Why is it that it has a single function from every other object? Tell me, like, um, why is it that from two, two under bar, there's a single function into one. Does anyone want to say? Why is there a single function into the terminal, into the singleton? 
to go from a set of size two to a set of size one? Why is there why is there no because, choice? Why is there just one function? It, yeah. It it can only map to that single um yeah. thing yeah. within there. Yeah, there's there's no choice, right? What thing do you it's like it's like coming into a food kiosk, right? And and they say you know, what food do you want? And you say, Well, what do you have? And they say, Rice. Like, uh <laughs> well, I guess I'll have uh uh rice um like there's no choice right um it's like they only have one item it's like there's a vending machine as as eugenia chang says and there's only one item you know left um you know the 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 um i don't know the seven up or something there's only seven up and so that's all you get you only have one choice that's it there's, there's no choice there's only one function that maps it because it maps both these things to what? The single function that goes from two to one, what does it map one to? What does it map the first element of this of this um, two element set to? What is it what does it map it to? The only thing here, right? There's no choice. What does it map this to? The only thing here. Like there's no choice. There's just one function from this entire set, from this set, to this, right? Does that make sense? Are, are, are people comfortable with that? Yes. Okay. Do you, does anyone want me to spend more time on that? We so, haven't any choice uh, for choosing other things. Yeah. yeah. No, notice that it's a bit asymmetric, right? We have a function from each set here, one function for the entire set into this into this terminal object, right? That, that's what it turns out it's going to define as a terminal object. We have a single unique, unique morphism from every other object to it. That's what's going to define it. And there's a unique morphism from this object to it, right? It's the, the function that just sends both of these sends all the elements to this single thing because there's no choice, right? Um, it's, it, th there's a single one from this to it because it sends all of these to this one thing, right? It's a single unique morphism from each of these uh, objects to this object. That's what makes it a terminal object. But I said there was an asymmetry because if you look the other way, there's a function there's a function from this object, the terminal object, to what? How many fun how many uh, functions are there from this terminal object to three? There are three. How many possible? Three. three. There are three. One from this one to one. That's one function, right? That's one possible function. Yeah. One from this one to two, and yeah, and another another function that goes from this one to three. So there's three, one for each element of these guys, right? So like the terminal object has functions into each element of these guys over here, but it is a single function going the other way, which does the only thing possible. I'll have uh, rice, please. Yeah. Yeah. As a vegetarian, I often get that. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, give me the menu. Uh, oh. Yeah, I'll have the, I'll have the, veggie burger. Thanks. Um, yeah, um, the only option. Okay, so we got something like this. Here's the, the singleton object in set, right? The terminal object. Here's the unique morphism from this to this that sends each of A and B, to whatever to the, the only thing there is, rice, right? And um, and then. There's one morphism, one function from this into A and another one from this into B and, and they go this way, right? How many morphisms are there from, from the singleton to itself? How many ways one. can it map to itself? One. one. How many ways from A and B to itself? Two. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm? Two? Uh, four. Uh, two? Four. Two. Four. Four. Uh, two yeah. uh, power two. Two to the power two. That's right. And this yeah. will turn out to be really important. Turns out powers are really important. Right? We're going to come back to that about why that is. We're going to have to do with things called exponential objects and which represent functions. So it's, set is very, very nice thing. And one of the things that makes it nice is the morphisms in set, the maps between sets, can themselves be elements of a set. And it turns out that's not unique to set. We, we say in category theory, a category has exponential objects if it has this, if it has the ability to represent its morphisms as objects in that set, right? We can have a in set, we can have a set of functions. And in, in functional programming languages like Haskell or Scala, Scala is this whole functional side, right? Um, scheme, we can have sets of functions. Yeah. Um, and 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 so those that's where those exponential objects come from. And it's one of the reasons why it's like two to the three power. So here, the, the four functions, right? One of the functions is maps both A and B to A. Another function maps both A and B to B. Each of them, you know, both of them are mapped to B. If you get an A, you get a B. If you get a B, you get a B. Okay. And then there's, well. There's the identity one, A goes to A, B goes to B. And then there's the kind of the twist, right? The flip one, the swap, right? A goes to B and B goes to A. Those are the four functions, right? And the identity I've driven, I've drawn with this little dotted arrow because it's a special one, right? Um, so I, I sort of showed an example of this principle for 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 set. Are you are you comfortable with that? Are people comfortable with that? Are you okay with this? Yes. Thank you. Anything that, that's really confusing people here? Okay, we're gonna we're getting into some pretty substantive things. And and like I fully understand if your head starts to to spin. It took me a long time to get these through this thick cranium of mine. Okay. Um, okay, so I want to ask you, um, what can we deduce, like what sets, or what, at least what size of sets are A and B here? What would A fit? Is, oh, A is two. Ah. Okay, and B? Oh, B is 27, is not? B is three. B is three. So what is, and, and so four is two to the two, right? 27 is three to the three, right? Three times three times three. Now let's talk about these ones mapping from A to B. Mm -hmm. A to B. Uh, um, uh, how A to how B. many? Yeah, two, or or uh, let's 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 go with two. this. Let's go with this one first. How about from B to A? So here we're going from. We have something that goes from B to A. Uh, B to A become. Uh -huh. oh, sorry, B uh -huh. to A become A power B. Uh, a B to A B. becomes A to the power B at the yeah. size of A, which is what? A is What's the two size and B yeah. is three. That's right. And one way you could think about it, if, if this is three elements, just just if it had three elements, just think about, you know, functions in this me mechanistic way, right? If if A had three elements, um, or sorry, B has three elements and A has two, it's like it's like you're picking out for the three elements of B, right? For each of the elements of B, it's like you're picking out a bit, one or zero, right? From A, because A only has two elements. Call, we'll call them one and zero, right? It's almost like a string of three ones and zeros, right? You have uh, three 
three binary digits, zero, one, zero, one, you know, some zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. And so it's two to the third, right? It's, we have two choices for the first, right? The first one over from over here, the first of these three could go to zero or could go to one. The second of the three could go to zero or one. The third of the three could go to zero or one, right? That's the way I think of it. And I, I often go back to that, actually, if I forget. Oh, yeah, it's like three to two. It's like picking bits, right? And so I feel really comfortable with strings of bits, like how many there are, two to the n. Um, so if I map from n, the, the thing with n elements in it into two elements, I know it's two to the n. So I know, okay, it's a to the power of b. That's how I used to remember it particularly. Oh, and here, why nine? Why are there nine? Why are there nine of these functions? Yeah. Because uh, from A to B, B is three, yeah. three power yeah. two, A is two. That's right. So for each of these two elements here, each of these two, for the first one, we have to pick one of how many things? three, right? This is three. So for each of these, we have to pick one of these three. And for the second one of these, we have to pick the one of these three. So we have three times three choices or three squared choices, right? Right? Um, uh, for these going from A to B, from A to B, right? So it's, if it's mapped from A to B, it's B, the size of B to the size of the A power. Yeah. For each of these two things, let's see this. We, we have one of, you know, we have three choices in here. So it's three times three. And in general, if there are N things over here, for each of these N things, we'd have three. So be three to the N. Three for the first possible choices, three for the second, et cetera. Are people feeling comfortable with that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. 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 How about this one? I know it looks a bit like a hat or something, like a bobby hat. In a is what one. Mm. And a B mm. is two. Mm. Mm. What are these guys here? C is these... uh, one. Okay. C is, C is one. Oh, C is ah, one. okay. C is zero. Okay. Okay, let's let's have a discussion about that. Is it one or is it zero? It, it, it's zero? got a it's got a it's got a nice it's tempting. Whoa, it's tempting to think it's one, one. right? That um because one would have one if if this were one, how many morphisms would it have for itself? One to itself. One, yeah. One. But if if this were one, how many morphisms would it have into this? Two. Or it would have two, right? Two, yeah. If, two. Yeah. Yeah. Two. two. Yeah. So so can this be one of size one? I don't think one. No, it's zero. 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 Because if this were one, it would have two morphisms. One that maps from the single thing here to the first of these guys. And then another possibility that maps from the single thing here to the second of these guys. Remember, there's one of these functions for each element. It's like these functions into from the terminal object one. If this were the terminal object, there'd be a function from for each of the elements over here, kind of names that element, designates that element, the function into that element. But here there's only one. Could this be zero? Well, yeah. Could this be zero? How many morphisms are there from zero into into uh, a two element set? How many? I know it's confusing. Um, one. How many from z uh, one? It's called absurd. Because uh, every uh, number, <laughs> every number to power zero uh, equal one. Yeah, that's that's uh, okay. Uh, every number to power zero equals one. That's exactly right. 
And we declare, that's exactly right, known. And we declare even zero to the zero, we're going to declare it one. Um, so uh, so that's that's right, and every number to, the, to zero. So there'll be one. And what does it do? Well, there's nothing to do, right? It maps, it maps, it has no elements to map. A function has to map for each element of its input to a particular, for each of its possible inputs to a particular element of its output. How many inputs are there if this is zero for this function? How many inputs does it have to reason about? Zero. Nothing. Zero inputs, um, right? It's, I mean, it's empty. It, so it doesn't have any work to do. It's like this is a single function because it has no work to do. It's the absurd function. It just, it has nothing to do. It's like discrete, no uh, discrete function, discrete morphism you uh, uh, showed uh, mm. uh, in the last session. I think that's probably right. I, I'd have to um, unpack that a bit, but um, yeah, it is no no work to do, no work to do at all. Um, so there's there's a vacu vacuous function. It, it it's it's absurd. It just doesn't it it. You know, like you don't have to you can't say anything about what it does because it doesn't have to do anything it just is okay and i nona i agree with you it's whatever to the zeroth power is one how about mapping from zero to one how many functions are there for that one uh, mm -hmm. one that same it's a vacuous yeah. function it has nothing to do nothing. to go to this nothing okay yeah now, how about from mapping to itself, from zero to My, zero? Well, it doesn't have it doesn't have identity. anything to do. Yeah, it, yeah. Identity. It has nothing to do. It's the identity. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now, so suppose we think, okay, this might be zero. This might be one. This might be two. Is it consistent with this? If this is one, why are there two here? What do these represent? Like. These uh, two things two option to map to. Yeah, the two things to map to. These kind of represent the elements of this one, the two elements of this one. This one kind of represents maybe the first, this one represents maybe the second, but it kind of represents those elements. Um, how about this one going the other way? Would that be the is there only one function from two into one? And if so, why? From something with two elements into something with one element. Is there only one function? One, one yeah, power why, two, one. And, and why is that? Yeah, why Why is it that there's only one possible one? Uh, because one power two equal one. Well, that's true. That's true. You can think about it symbolically, and, and that's a, 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 a valuable perspective. Yeah. There's yeah. there's no choice, right? Again, it's like yeah, we haven't. Um, it's a it's like I only have one choice of what to eat: rice. And there's two people, right? For for my friend, um, if my friend comes, he's gonna have rice. If I come, I'm gonna have uh rice. So like, <laughs> each of us, each of the possibilities is just gonna have rice, right? Um, rice. Okay. Okay. Okay, this is this one made of made you thought. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I should have said the the yellow. I can't. Uh, yellow is four. There's four of these. Um, okay. So, what size are each of these? You know, you wanna what what size are what size is a? Is two. Yeah, because this is two to the two, right? Okay, that I mean that's a good hint. It's two to the two. Okay. Um uh how about how about this one? Three. Well maybe I'll maybe I'll ask D. What is that? How many ones are in it, do you think? We have four two. self so two. yeah, two. Okay, good. Good. Um oh man, this one got cut off. There's only one self loop here. Um, but uh this one, how many uh what what size do you think it is? Three. Three. Three, three to the three, right? It starts to give a hint. So let's go with this working hypothesis. Go with the working hypothesis. Um, how about this one? There's a single self loop 
So that suggests it's a candidate for being of what size? Either what or what? Zero or one. Oh, and one. it's zero. zero or one. one. Okay. And how do we know it's zero? How do we know it's not one? Uh, when it goes so, to objects that have, or yeah, objects that have more than one, it still only yeah. has one morphism. It only has one. It only maps to, to the whole thing. It's a, it's the absurd, the vacuous function, function that doesn't have to do anything, nothing to specify. There's only one of them. If this were one, how many would there be into to something of size two? two. If this two. were of size one, how, there'd be two, one for each element of the target, right? How about this one here? And it kind of got cut off, but but there's one thing. I, which What is this? What's the size of this? One. Nothing? Uh, no, that's one. Sizes? One. Because there's how many morphisms? How many how many functions into this? Two functions. There are two functions. Two. 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 And this, how many into this one? Uh three. Three. Yeah. And is that consistent? And, if this were size three, one, would there be one for each? Yeah. 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 I, I got yeah. this. Yeah. So tell me, um, why isn't there one from C to E? Like why 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 is there not? In fact, why isn't there one from B to E and A to E and D to E? Why because, why, are, why is it because mm -hmm. of our definition of functions, uh for something to be a function, it has to map to a uh I don't want to say element, but I, I'm trapped feeling like saying no, element. No, you can. So... You, you can. You can say element in explaining it. I mean, okay. we, we can switch to talk about functions. It's just when we're in category theory, we'll be reason about the categories um, in the network of relationships. But yes, that's that's correct. There's um, that for each element, the definition of a function would say for each element, you need to um, you need to do what? An element map. has to map mm -hmm. to an element within the um, the target. target. Yeah, yeah. And so, can this could C map? How many elements does C have? One. One. Could it map that into E? To mm, can no. it? No. Why not? Because E There's doesn't. There's no element apply. within E. There's no elements. And same thing for B. And same thing for A. And same thing for D. What's the only thing that can map into itself, uh, to E? Itself. Itself, right? It's got no work to do anyway, so so there's only one of them. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and does the rest of this job, like, does it make sense there's only one from the two element set into the one element set? Yeah. Like, intuitively, does we that make sense? We have just one choice. One. We have only run choice. I'll have rice and my if my brother comes, he'll have rice too, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, for each possible tag, I'll have rice. Yeah. Um, and and same thing with with this. There's only only one one choice. Yeah. Um. Uh, and for each of these, there's, there's maps into, um. For, for each of, of these three, there's maps into these two. So it's like a set of three bits in a row, one or zero for the first possible value here, one or zero for the second, and one or zero for the third. So three times, sorry, two times two times two, or two to the third, or eight. Does that make sense, folks? Thank you. Are you feeling comfortable with this? So you may wonder, like, well, uh, come on, this is this is a bit much. Like, why are you talking about all this? That the point is, like, the relationships in which an object is embedded tell us all these things about the object. Here, they tell us the, the key fact of its size. That's number of elements. Remember. At the cost of flipping through some slides, remember that sets have no structure. I mean, they're they're basically like discrete categories. All they have is identity morphisms. There's no structure other than that. Each L, I'm looking within a set here. I'm looking like within the set, right? 
there's no there's no sort not like one element is bigger than another or one element is less is is divides another inside the set no 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 inside the set it's just a bunch of points right and and um and what i'm saying is that uh while uh we can actually know a, a huge the key thing which is the size of this set because this set is really no no other structure and so on. Um, and these are just like points. At the end of the day, this could be three, you know, mugs, or it could be three, you know, uh, uh, three gloves, or it could be three, you know, uh, headphones, or three masks, or, or whatever. These are, these all share these, characteristic of 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 three hood and in the same sense it's just a matter of naming what these what these ones are um it's just a matter of of, of sort of different names uh uh for for those uh things in there and what i'm saying is that we can find out that essential information the essential information is how big is that set how many things in there and some way of kind of talking about each of its elements, which are maps um, from the singleton object and set into that object. And they're in one-to-one -one correspondence. Very, very nice and very deep implication. So what I'm saying is like, when you start to view things here categorically, you start to realize, well, instead of being like intrinsic thing, having to talk about these it's actually a lot of discussion we can have, a lot of discourse, a lot of understanding we can have by like talking about the morphisms into it. And we can start to identify key things. Now we might not identify, you know, is this three mugs of water or is it three masks? Uh, or, you know, is it um, three, three gloves? But in, in categorical perspective, things that are isomorphic, things that are the same except for labeling, the same except for the naming, uh, are essentially the same. Um, so in many categories, we collapse those. We say the essential thing is how many of them are. Well, I'll come back to this point, but you could see here, we can deduce something very important. I mean, we can, through talking about the morphisms, functions here and set we can talk about some absolutely key el a key key components of this this thing which is how big is this and we can talk about each element of it um as, as sorry as maps from um from the singleton object um just as this illustrates um so here we're starting to shift our perspective a bit instead of like dwelling on what's inside of this object, got to peer in with a microscope or something. No, no, no. We can we could start to deal. How does it, what's the role it plays with respect to other objects? What's the role it plays with respect to the terminal object? What are the relationships it's in? Those can define the essential characteristics of the object rather than looking inside of it. It's how it's in context, the system in which it's embedded. Are people feeling uh, comfortable with that? That it's sort of yes. idea? Yes. I, I know this is just an initial look, but we're going to unpack more of it related, as Tony asked, to the to the exercise. These were on the exercise, but we're going to see the surjection and bijection thing in just a minute. So a lot of this has to do with this notion of um, paying attention to the roles things play more than what's secretly in them, what's their intrinsic, you know, internal state. It's really what role do they play in the category. That's the more sort of deeper thing. And we can jettison a lot of our absolute need to talk about the elements categorically by dealing with like functions into it. But I want to talk about another thing, which which Eugenia Chen mentions in this chapter um sort of 
and I mean, she sort of alludes to it, um, but it has to deal with this notion of injective functions, surjective functions, and bijective functions. And as for for some of these things, I've taken taken the liberty of, of taking some images from you know these masters, uh, uh, Brendan Fong and David Spivak, for example, or from Eugene Cheng. So you know we might depict uh, you know an arbitrary function um, as having a mapping for each possible input, right? For each possible value it could get, it has to determine a unique for each of those, one and only one value from the codomain, from the from the output set, right? So this one happens to pick, you know, if it gets this one, if, if we're asked, what's the value for this one? It'll pick this one. If it's, what's the value for this one? It'll pick this one. If it's, what's the value for this one? It'll pick that one. So like Eugenia Cheng talks about the vending machine, right? Where you poke the buttons and maybe two buttons both give you bananas or whatever. Okay, now a surjective function though has a very nice feature. What is, it, what is the feature of a surjective function, which is sometimes written this way? What's the feature of that? It hits everything that, that, in the target side. Yeah. It hits everything in the codomain, everything in the target set. It reaches everything there. Does this guy reach everything in the target set? This one here? No. Uh, no. No. Misses Subject, one, right? Subjective no. Uh, function like y, mm. uh, f, a, f, x, uh, equal y. It, it, so, so. Yeah, okay, so uh, f of x equals y for all y, right? There's some x that maps to it. For every one of these ones, there's at least one of the inputs that maps to it. It reaches all of all of the, the image of this function is this entire codomain, the entire set here. There's at least one input for every one of these. Could there be two inputs that go to the same one? For a surjective function, yeah, yes, yeah, there can, yeah, there can be no problem, no problem. But in now, an notice, injective function, no. we can't. Aha, uh aha. -huh. Uh -huh. So injective function, you can't. What's what's the feature of injective function? What's the kind of the nice property injective function has? Uh, the another name is one to one in mathematics. Okay. And uh, uh -huh. uh, we uh, we have no different elements uh, elements um, in the domain domain and yeah. uh, map to same element in the codomain. Right. Uh, so there's no x one equal is one x one equal x two. If uh, f x one um, yeah. equal f x two in the mathematics is this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. Uh so is this function here surjective? Is it surjective? This one yes. here? Yes. Is it injective? No. No. And no. why is it not injective? You have more than one element in your domain going to the same element in your codomain. That's right. Yeah. Is this one surjective? This one here? No. No. Why not? Because It's missing that middle element there. Yeah, and doesn't reach this one. Is it injective? Yeah. yeah, is it injective? Yeah. And because there's these two don't map on, these are the only two here that happen to be here, and they don't map onto the same element, right, um, in the target. So there's no clash. There's no, there's no loss of ability to say which one reached it. Yeah. Now, this is a bijective one, right? Um, these two are isomorphic. Um, including two surjective yeah. and injective functions. Yes, exactly. And you'll notice that um, there's different arrows used. This one actually, there's another arrow, which is like a hooked arrow. It's like as a hook at the end. <laughs> Pathometricians love these special symbols. And this is like, uh, this is one way to write it, very common. And another way is with a little hook. Um, um, and surjective, um, you could write like that. 
Um, are people feeling pretty comfortable with this basic kind of set theoretic notion with elements before we go on and talk about their categorical analog? Are you feeling kind of comfortable with how this how this how uh, these terms are used? Thank you. Okay, so let's go talk about monomorphisms and epimorphisms. Okay, so here we have this so-called fork diagram, okay? Um, and so uh, we have a uh, morphism from X to Y, um, and then we have two morphisms. So these are objects in some category and uh, these, these dots, right? Z, X, and Y. We have a morphism from X to Y. So some mapping from, from X to Y, great. Um, and then we have, um, before that, but located end to end with it, we have a morphism G1 and another one G2. These are two ways of going from Z to X, okay? And the property is, F is a monomorphism if for all objects Z and G1 and G2 that go from Z to X, so for any two ones of these, if, if F after G1 equals F after G2, if for all possible choices of this, F after these things implies G1 equals G2, then F is monomorphic is the idea. If no matter what one you give me, what ones you, you pick from Z to X, um, I say, well, if F after G1 equals F after G2, then it, it must be that G1 equals G2, um, that, that F is kind of left cancelable. It, it can, um, it has these properties that if these two things are equal, F after this equals F after that, then, then it's gotta be G1 equals G2. What does this correspond to in terms of um, injective or surjective functions? Anyone? So I'm gonna say there's no wiggle room. It's like, it doesn't let G1 and G2 be up to any funny business with respect to, um, to, to kind of messing around with the uh, element of, 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 of uh, or messing around with how they map uh, here. That, um, that even, even if they cleverly map some things onto the same element or something like that, it will, it will discover, it will discover the difference between them. So what, what does this correspond to? So I, I would I say that it voice. corresponds to injective because the only way for mm -hmm. the first part of the statement to be true is if the second part of the statement is true. And that's similar to injective where the only way for an element to end up to the same element within the um, mm. codomain mm. is mm. if the function applied to it is the, or I mean, if the element initially was the same element. Mm, 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 mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Say, so, no, no, do you want to say something too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you say uh, it can be uh, additionally of injective and can be bijective one to one? Uh, it could be bijective, correspondence. it could be bijective, yeah, it could be. I mean, well, okay, so it turns out this does correspond to injectivity, so monomorphic corresponds for sets to injectivity, that it doesn't map, it doesn't collapse any two elements. Imagine, um, but that holds for bijection too, because as Noni, as you said, this is both surjective and injective. So so yeah, I mean, um, uh, bijective function would qualify for this too. Let's suppose that F weren't injective. It, it suppose it, 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 you know, carelessly mapped two things onto the same element. Why would this not this property not hold? What what can we do cleverly 
if it mapped two things onto it, why would it not be the case that f after g1 equals f after g2 implies g1 equals g2? What's the blind spot? What's the wh what would it not notice if g1 and g2 differed by? If I could use that weird term, suppose that g1 uh, and g2. Suppose subjective. we have a function if... f. No, well, suppose we had a function f like this that secretly. Suppose it's not injective. I, I claim that there's a blind spot that it won't be able to figure out um, that G1 and G2 are different um, or it, it won't be able to reliably figure out that whether or not they're the same or different it, because of the blind if, spot. Is it perhaps if um, F sends everything to the exact same value? Okay. So if you, it not, you're, you're getting warm, but imagine if F collapsed these two elements. So imagine if, if this one is X here and this one is Y. And so imagine that F is not injective. It's, it's a bad, it's a, it's, a, it's a not injective function, right? It maps these two onto the same thing. Um, I would say that we could have then F after G1 be the same be the same as f after g2 even if f at g1 and g2 were not the exactly the same function because they could g1 and g2 could take advantage of f's blind spot g1 and g2 you know remember g1 and g, this mapping we're talking about for f is this one here g1 and g2 map some other set z into X. So it's kind of, they're in a proceeding stage like back here, right? And they map onto these. And what I'm saying is they could be different. Like G1 could map something onto this guy. G2 could map something onto which one? So the lowest one? I'm saying, uh, yeah. So I'm saying I'm constructing a case where G1 and G2 can secretly take advantage of half. They take advantage of, of its blind spot. So G1 and G2 are mapping from some other set onto this guy. What I'm saying is G1, um, I'm going to show something where they could be the same. F after G1 could be the same in, in its behavior as F after G2 without G1 and G2 being the same because they're, they're taking advantage of its blind spot. So G1 could map some some element in in Z onto this guy. G2 could map it instead onto Larissa, you said it earlier, onto what? The lowest element. The lowest one. Yeah. And and then F after G1 and F after G2 would give the same result, wouldn't they? Because F just yeah. collapses those to the Pipes. same thing. So that's its blind spot, right? It can't. It can't tell what G1 and G2 were doing with respect to these ones because they all get mushed together. It, it gloms them together. It, it, it just sort of, you know, uh, just, you know, ignores those distinctions, right? Um, it it, it uh, sort of muddles them together. Um, so what I'm saying is like, this could be true for G1 and G2 being different, um, uh, but this property could still hold because F, F is blind to it because it maps these together without G1 and G2 being the same. Do you see what I'm saying? Are you feeling comfortable with that? I see what you're saying. I just, I need to chew on it a little. Yeah, so... Maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'm going to see. Would this still like I, preserve structure in this case? Um, well, it's not really um, preserving structure. I'm going to see if I can, if I can do something. I haven't rehearsed this. Let me go back to my little drawing thing. And, and um, I, I, I try to be really neat when I give you things um, in assignments but here i'm gonna draw can you see this yes okay 
so so here we're going to have um I'm, I'm for simplicity i'm going to write this as z right and i'm going to write this as we're going to use this nice little example that we had here um hey come on uh this guy here um where we have three and then two okay uh hey um so we're gonna have three right and i think this is called x right and this one is called y is that right this last one where it has two right all i'm doing is i'm recreating basically hey hey um recreating this guy here um with but proceeded sorry um so this is uh, x to y and this is z to x and i'm gonna show two different g1s and g2s okay um so what we saw from the diagram is something like this right mm -hmm. and like this this is f right this is f here right all right i'm gonna put it in red because it that's how it is in the diagram and now i'm gonna draw uh a g1 mm. i'm gonna draw a g1 okay g1 is gonna map this guy right remember g1 goes from z to x remember that just just so we're we're on the same page g1 goes from z to x right so i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, draw that and this one is going to map to this guy now i'm going to draw g2 oh i'm drawing horrible arrowheads i'm sorry i when i draw these for you i like to draw these nice little kind of drafting arrowheads um and here we go so i should i should really do it here that's that's g1 mm -hmm. it's g1 and now let's do g2 i'm going to I'm going to do nice magenta. Here's um, G1. Or G, uh, sorry, G2 is going to map this guy to this guy. Fair enough. Whoops. Mm -hmm. um, hey, hey, get back there. Um, yeah. And this one, it's going to map to here. That's going to be G2. Okay. Um, and what I'm saying is that um, so what I want you to answer is if, so I, I'd like you to tell me, um, so this is, uh, monomorphisms, uh, and injectivity. Eh? What I want you to tell me is does here, um, uh, so does F uh after a g1 equal uh, some way to to do a question mark equal but i i can't remember um how to do it off hand um uh equals g2 um maybe i'll make this a little uh something like that um for the moment uh, does this uh, equal that in terms of its mapping from Z to Y? Um, does the results of composing, post-composing F after G1, does it equal F after G2? Could you tell me? Yes, because uh, G, uh, G1 mm -hmm. and G2 uh, are setting up with the other uh, functions. That, Z to that, that's right. So the, the, the net effect of of g1 uh after uh sorry f after g1 the net effect of that is well i'll i'll, I'll kind of show it here i'll show it in a dotted line right the net oh, effect of it is it maps this one of the composition it maps it into which one to this one here right that's the kind of net effect of f after g1 right um and uh, for for this starting at this one and the net effect for this one is going to here right that's 
that's f after g1 right do, do you see why f post composed with g1 it goes from this well you follow it here and it goes to here and it goes from here to here and then it goes to here so the net effect is all the way through from z to y is like this do you see that are you comfortable with that yes thank you yeah, yeah. okay and now let's do that with g2 now where does g2 map this guy this first guy up here where does it map it where does it go the the top still within y the top still mm -hmm. good where does it map this lower guy? To the lower guy. To the lower guy. So what I'm saying is here, uh, does F1 after G1 equal F, F after, sorry, F after G1 equal F after G2 here? Yeah. yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. Yes. It, it, it answers it. Or it, it, um, uh, it, it, it equals it. So, okay, so that's that's good to have clarity. Does does G one equal G two? Is G one equal to G two? Is the function from no. uh, Z no. to X equal? No, 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 they are not equal. They are not, they equal. Are not equal. So what I'm saying is that one we just said would violate the fact that if this is the case it was the case here then it follows the g1 equals g2 it that's not the case right um here here this is the case but it does not follow that g1 equals g2 no here's the case where they're not the same it took advantage of the blind spot this is the blind spot right it crushes these two into the same thing do you understand that yes yeah so if, if it's injective, if it doesn't, it doesn't have blind spots. It doesn't crush two things into the same target, right? It, it would treat those differently, and this wouldn't be a problem. Um, it's really for injective functions, or sorry, for monomorphic, which are injective functions, where this is the case. Are you comfortable with that idea? It's like F leaves no blind spots for G1 yeah. and G2 to take advantage of. Do you get that? Yeah. How are people feeling about that? Are you are you feeling okay? Sorry, you said that F leaves no mm -hmm. blind spots or it does leave blind spots? It has no blind spots. It has blind spots only if, what I'm saying is that if this is the case, then F yeah. has no blind spots. If this is the case for all G1 okay. and G2 and Z, it has no blind spots. Um, if, if F is a monomorphism, it has no blind spots. It has no blind spots generated by mapping two things here to the same thing. If it maps two things here to the same thing, it has a blind spot that some G1 and G2 could take advantage of cleverly. Right, And what I'm saying is, um, uh, if F doesn't have those blind spots, we call it a monomorphism. It doesn't collapse two things into the same. But this is defining it not in terms of elements, right? We haven't referred to elements at all here. I, of course, in, in explaining this, referred to elements to give some intuition. But is this referring to elements, this definition? Sorry, we just, we just saw. Is this definition referring to elements of X? No. It's it's defining it purely in terms of relationships, that F is a monomorphism, um, if this is the case. And it turns out that corresponds in set to guess what? Injectivity. Injection. Injectivity. It, it The implications of it for set is, is it injective? Is it injective? So the So something that's monomorphic, in set, if these were sets, X, Y, and Z were sets, and these these were functions, G1, G2, and F, um, um, then this corresponds to injectivity. F is monomorphic means F is injective. 
Okay, epimorphisms. Does this correspond to surge activity or injectivity? What do you think? Surge activity. Okay, and why is that? Why is that? Two different J. If, okay. Um... Okay, let's let's go back to our little little thing here. Um and let's Let's uh, imagine that, so we could draw another case, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we'll call it uh, epimorphism, right? Epimorphism, epimorphism and surjectivity. Mm -hmm. You see, I'm, uh, what's going on is we're defining these things by the roles they play, not by how they handle elements. We're not saying, Oh, that, you know, that um, how does it handle elements that determines it's how, how does it interact with other, with other um, uh, morphisms, other, other functions. Okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about it. This, um, this, this light I know is blinking on not that might be driving you wild. Give me, give me just a sec. I'm going to turn on this. Oh, sorry, it's getting dark here. Um, we're way to the east of you right now. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, um, so, um, so here we're gonna have maybe just by the same um, inspiration as here. Um, we'll we'll deal with surjective uh, functions. Um, uh, and we'll ask, is it surjective or not, right? Um, uh, and let's let's think about something that's uh, not okay. So, so, yeah. So, well, let's let's talk about. Okay, so we're gonna draw draw in these things. We're gonna have now. Uh, we're gonna have. Oh no, I don't want that. Um, we're gonna have this. All right, there we go. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm terribly bad at drawing these things. There we go. Um, and uh, there we go. And we're gonna have let's say two, two things here, and let's say three things here. Okay. There we go. Uh, that's very nice. And and this is where G1 and G2 are going to be. Where's F going to go? Can you tell me? Where is F going to go? Oh, well, you know what? I'm, I did something silly. Um, I should have probably done it uh, uh, the, other, the other way. Here we go. Okay, I'm sorry. So here we go. We're going to draw from a smaller thing here. I'm just setting this up to to illustrate uh, intuition here. Let's get, clean that up. Um, okay. Um, and then we'll have it go to a, a bigger set. So we can easily make it injective or, I mean, surjective or not. And then maybe we have G1 and G2. Um, they're going to pick out a blind spot, pick out a prop. Okay. And maybe they'll map um map onto this yeah something like that okay okay so where does f go does f go uh to the later side or or back here in this one f is Good on this friends. side right yeah yeah okay so suppose that um you notice the the definition here right um uh F F is an uh, is a hey hey come on uh, epi yeah, epimorphism uh, if for all objects Z and G one G two uh, why does Z um if G one after F equals G two after F implies G one equals G two okay um okay uh so suppose that F were not surjective 
so that might allow this might lead to it no oh, um we're gonna color it red uh might lead this guy to go here right um and uh this guy maybe goes to here so is that a surjective function no no right and just to be consistent with the names we have x y and z here right we have x hmm? we have x we have y and we have z okay cool. okay um and now i'm telling you that um we can pick out a g1 and g2 which take advantage of f's blind spots they take advantage of knowledge they they're scheming they're devious they they know they know f has some blind spots um and their f and g are not going to be different but they're going to appear different when when you have f before them um uh they're gonna appear different so what would those be can anyone come up with a kind of an idea to take advantage of of f that, that even though g1 and g2 are not the same they'll kind of look the same when they come after f let me, let me compose it all the way anyone have an idea how could g1 and g2 be different Maybe mm -hmm. so I'm gonna, yeah, I'm, gonna I'm, gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna draw kind of a particularly sort of simple one for 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 that. And then that that what I've just drawn is is G one. Mm -hmm. That's G one. Um Maybe, maybe to sort of prettify this, so I'll, I'll label this G under bar one. Boom. Hey, hey, get back there. There we go. Okay, there we go. That's G1. Okay, what could G2 do? And, um, and uh, G1 after F would equal G2 after F, even though the two are different even though G1 is going to be different from G2. G2 doesn't contain the spot, uh, that is spot. I mean, the middle one. Oh. Okay, it's, so when you say it doesn't contain, meaning this, this one here this one. or this one here? This this one or uh, this one? The last one. Because remember, G1, remember G1 and G2 both have to be functions, so they have to map all of these guys here to this. So what is G2 gonna do for, so I'm gonna show G2 as doing the same thing for for this one. Mm -hmm. But but Nestoran, I think you've got the right idea. What could G2 do that's different, but it wouldn't be noticed if it were composed with F. It would be in the blind spot. What could it do? We didn't consider the middle one and just uh, uh, just it, it contains the last one. I mean, okay, so if, if we did something like this, yeah. right? Um, but what would it do for this one? It's got to got to map it to somewhere. Where could it map it? To, that would be different itself. from G one. To itself. Um, no, well, no, no. Okay, but if we map, it would be going no, to. No, no it's mm -hmm. the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keep say it. I think you've got the basic right idea. Where could it map to? Where can it map to? Oh, what I'd say is to another one. Yeah. So it could map to this guy here, right? Um uh so so something like that. So that would be G2. Right? Um probably I should make it make it nice. There we go. G2. There we go. There we go. There we are. So what I'm saying is, uh, what I want to know is, 
So is it the case that G1 after F, oops, sorry, after F equals, I'll put it in the question mark, um, G2 after F. That's what I want to know. Is it is it the case that that uh, with this current thing? Well, let's compose them for the composition. Where would where would G one after F go? If we composed G one after F, where does this guy go? Where does he go in here? Where does he map to? If we compose G one after F. Where does where does this one map to? The top. The top one. Yeah. Hold on. Maps to the top. Okay. So that's that's good. Okay. Good. Where does this that's one map to? One. If we compose a G one after after uh, after F, where does it map to? G two after F is the last one. Yeah, the last one in Z, Z, right? It's yeah. To Z, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Okay, now how about G2? I'll switch over to that color. Where does G2 after F, where does it map this one? Remember G2 after F, it takes a result. To, it's it's going, G2 after F goes from what, co, from what domain to what codomain? G2 after F goes from where to where? It goes from X to what? Like uh, G1 goes to C. Well, well, I mean, G2 after F, it maps from set X to set what? Z. C. Z. Z, right? I mean, F goes from this to this. G2 goes from this to this. So so G2 after F goes from this to Z, from X to Z. Okay. So what does it map? The first guy here in X two. Where does it go in Z? The top to one. Z. The X top to one. Z. Yeah, you can you can just trace it through, right? Um, goes to here and goes to there. Okay. How about the bottom one? Where does it go to for for G two after F? Bottom one. The bottom one. Good. Good. Okay. So my question that I posed earlier, I want you to now answer it. Uh, what is, so are these two equal? Yeah. Yes, it is. It's yes. the exact same function from X to Z. Yeah. Does, does G1 equal G2? Yes. No. Because oh. X. No. And no, they're G1 and G2 are different. F equal. Yeah. Oh. G, G, G2 is is not the same function as G1. G1 is a function from Y to Z that maps this to this, this one to this, and this one to this. G2 is a function from Y to Z, and it maps this one to this, this one to this, but it maps this one to that. So they're not the same function. And so uh, what I'm saying is they're not epimorphic. Epimorphism is a very special sort of rich function. It's a function that avoids that sort of blind spot. It's a function that doesn't leave out any blind spot here. It maps to the entirety of this set, or else we could take advantage of it with different G1s, G2s, where their composition would look the same um, without them being the same. So this is a case where if F is not epimorphic, G1 and G2 could look the same after F, but not really be the same, right? So an epimorphism is something where if they look the same after F, they are the same. And that requires F to not leave any blind spots. Do you see what I mean? Does that mean we cannot determine if it is epimorphic without examining the elements of it, of the category? I well, mean, of the this objects? Is the this is the criteria. So no, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that at all. Because if if this criteria is the case, if if this criteria holds, um, if for all objects Z and G one and G two, 
g after f equals this equals this, then, then that is the case, then um, then uh, then f is epimorphic. This is not discussing where the map elements are mapped to. It just says if these two functions are the same, um, uh, if if consistently these two functions being the same mean these two functions are the same, you know that that make it up, then it is epimorphic. And that definition doesn't itself require us to to talk about the elements. Now you could say, well, okay, these functions are defined in terms of elements, and that's true. But we're talking about properties of functions that are that can be stated not referring to elements. This is, we, we don't have to refer to if x1 and x2, um, you know, are mapped to the, um, mapped um, into y, then, then f of x1 has to be different from f of x2. We can deal with the terms of relations that this one composed with this one. If, it, if it's consistently the case that this one composed with uh, this one being equal, um, if that implies that one equals that one, then then they're the same. So we can refer to these properties like epimorphisms or monomorphisms um, uh, or you know the elements of a set using using morphisms, um, which is is kind of cool. Now time unfortunately is out, and I know. Uh, at least one person here has to go to another class. So I'll see if I can talk more about this, um, uh, talk more about this uh, a little bit on on Thursday. Um, but we're going to go on and talk about uh, for Thursday um, some issues with uh, uh, with mappings as well, but mappings between categories which are called functors, okay? They're structure-preserving mappings. They preserve order. They respect the order in the category. They respect the structure of the objects. Um, they don't just scramble all the, the, the things willy-nilly when they map. They're a special sort of mapping that's a, a nice mapping, a, a respectful mapping, a mapping that takes the structure in the source, and it maps it to the structure in the target. And we talked about that just a little bit before, like homomorphisms of monoids, or like preserving the order of a mapping where one preorder to another in a way that preserves if A is above B, then F of A is above F of B, and preserves that ordering. And we're going to see this as a very natural representation. Okay. So that's all we have time for today. Um...